horse up a fix, he's a dry flag guy. He's a dry flag guy. So you want another day doing the same old tricks? You took it kinda hard, cause I hooked a lot of lips. He's a dry flag guy. He's a dry flag guy, yeah, I hooked a lot of lips. Well, I had to the sun, see the cell phone grow. The midges came alive, and heaven just begun. He's a dry flag guy. Hi, I'm Nate Brumley with Dryfly Innovations, and welcome to our second episode of Dryfly Adventures. Today we're going to take you right into the middle of a blue wing olive hatch. On December the 5th, we're fishing a small segment of the Boise River, and we're going to take you right in and let, let you look at what a blue wing olive hatch really looks like in winter. The bug selection that we'll be using to fish over the top of this group of fish and the blueing olive patterns that we use is a combination because what we find is is oftentimes the fish will not feed specifically on an adult bug. They'll oftentimes key on three different stages of the bug which would be emergers, hatchers, and then the adult patterns. There is a spinner in there, there also, but the spinner is a bug that we use a little bit later on in the hatch as the, as the majority of the bugs begin to fail. So, we're going to take you to the river immediately and we're going to get in on a blue wing olive hatch. Before we start that, we are also going to give you a little insight on how to fish a certain type of river. The river introduction we'll do here is, is a foam line within a back eddy. Take a really close look at the water here. Center current heavy stream, but look down to the far left where there's a boulder inside the water. Notice the direction of the water now. It makes a turn and there's a back eddy and the back eddy is choked with foam. If you see this scenario on any river you fish in the world, you know one thing. There are numerous big fish that are living in that gentle little flow coming backwards. Oftentimes, the best way to fish a foam line like this is to take the foam line from the top, cast into the foam line, and let it take that gentle ripple on a natural drift back toward the head of the hole. You have foam line at the surface, so the fish is not going to see your lines or your leaders, and the best possible drift, most times, is from the top and letting it drift back to you. You can see we hook a big rainbow here and fighting him here in the main current, but always when you see a foam line, a fish will live there. A little blueing olive hanging off his nose. Can you see it okay? It's going to, uh, you have to pretty much long cast to these guys if you're going to stand any chance at all. You can see them though, they're, they're they're feeding just right down in there, but boy, it's a it's a sneaky little bite. Now, there's those fish are in targets there, Jeff. Let's go ahead and hit this. You can see them rising there. There he is. Yeah, there's two of them right there in a line. There he is. There you go, right there. False take, Jeff. I mean, that just looks like he just come right up there and ate that thing, but that's not the case. That's a false take. Let's try this guy in here a little closer. 
Well, there you go. It was a nice take though, huh? Just about a half body out. There's a fish right there. Our episode today covered winter fishing. And in order to help you in the process of winter fishing, we have done two things that I believe could help a great deal in your winter fishing. We have a presentation, an educational presentation, called Winter Dry Fly Fishing. It's about an hour long, and it goes into all the intricacies of how to winter dry fly fish. We also have another DVD that's called Fishing with Blue Wing Olive, and that is a fantastic DVD to explain the hatches that actually happen in profuse numbers on the surface of the water in winter. Here are those two DVDs. We're going to move you now to a new river location over on the Owyhee River. We're still in winter, but we also want to give you some insights about how you might be able to use structure to be able to get a little bit closer to these targeted fish. So take a look here as we use the surrounding area, and in this case, a couple of large boulders to be able to get in position to move up on a fish. There's a small pod of fish that are feeding just beyond this boulder. I'm gonna to try to sneak out here and dapple the fly over the edge, and maybe get one of them to take. We'll see. Fish. I was above him too much, but it was on the right plane, and I couldn't see the buggy exactly, so I had to go for it. There he is. Oh, missed that son of a gun. Okay, let's put it back over there to him, but he ain't going to eat it for sure. Maybe his neighbor will. would help to see the fly, but you know what? There's no reason. I mean, that was on the... Oh. oh, that's him. Whoa. Like I said, he was the biggest... Wow, that feels heavy. Well, whoa. <laughs> you gotta be kidding. The heck we've got here, he hasn't even raised up to where I can look at him. But I don't want him around that big patch of crap, I can tell you that. What is with this fish, Jeffrey? Sometimes brownies get false reputation as not being hard fighters. And then you run into a guy like this. Oh, don't get dirty on me now. You stay away from there. Jeez! You gotta be kidding. <laughs> well, you dirty dog. Well, you son of a gun. Now that is flat out dirty. I mean, that is ridiculously dirty. I mean, look at that crazy little mother bear. Jeez. The fly we're tying for you today is what's called a slow stone. 
We featured it in some of the fishing segments, and I just give you a little insight about the bug. Even though it's tied with elk hair, it's got pretty good float. It is most effective used against those really tight edges and used in slower moving water, it's got a real belly down appearance to it, so it fits beautifully into slower moving water, but it does have elk hair, so you can fish it in a pretty hard riffle too. So, the fly we're doing for you today is called a slow stone. So, uh, let's tie a slow stone, uh, an imitation of a squala pattern that generally hatches in the early part of the season. Um, Basically what we're going to do is we're going to start the thread right here at the eye of the hook and we're just going to run it all the way down and in this case we're going to run it a little bit over the turn of the hook right about in there and then I'm going to lock that thread in nice and tight so we get no slippage at all. I'm going to roll it back to about there. We'll do a quick little trim there. One of the characteristics of a, of a stonefly is the fact that it packs around a little egg bag and if you're going to make a replication of a stonefly, it's always good to put this little imitation of this egg bag off of the end. Um, it's a unique process that they go through. When they deliver the eggs to the water, they actually lock their tentacles around the eggs after they're laid. They bring them to the water surface and they actually release them from there. So anyway, what we're going to do is make a little egg bag here on the end and we're going to spin it this way to start with. We're using black dub here. We're tying on a, on a hook that is a 2312 Tiemco. So that looks pretty good for the egg bag. Now I'm going to take what's called hackle stem and this would be just stems of hackle that have all the hackle that's been stripped off and you can kind of see what it looks like there in the photo and we're going to duplicate them too and we're going to lay them right out over the uh, egg bag just like this pinch them off make one nice circle around it now what we're going to do is we're going to stack up a whole bunch of a whole bunch of materials right here around that egg bag and to start with what we'll do is we'll roll down the hook a little ways, we'll slide in some uh, 100 denier uh, thread and I've doubled this because I want it to be a, a very pronounced segmentation on this bug. Uh, at this point what we want to do is we want to take a piece of foam and this will be the hard shell back on the bug and I'm tying it in down here because I purposely want some bulk to this bug. Um, we're going to use black super fine for the body because I like it because it's a real nice tight little body and we can bulk it up the way that we need to to make it just about perfect. Um, it takes a lot of dub and rarely do you ever do uh, more than, rarely would you ever get away with just doing one application. It takes a pretty good shot of dub to make the body as big and fat as these stoneflies actually are. Now what I'm going to do here is, is I'm going to pull this over, poke my thumb on top of it, throw a loose wrap around the, the foam and tighten that in really good. Then we'll take the thread and we'll take it and spin it make sure that it's connected together and then we'll throw it across the top just like this. Now one more turn here really tight, cinch that in there really tight and then turn and turn and tie off there and then we'll get our hackle stems again and those hackle stems we're going to line them up and we're just going to lay them out over the top of the eye just about like this and we're just going to tie them in just a nice little tie-in right over the eye of the hook. Anytime that you do wings on any kind of big bugs, it's always good to put illumination inside the wing. And the way that we do that is, is we use rainbow crystal flash and we'll lay it right out over the eye at a link that we know that will work. We'll flip it over the top just like this and secure it in. We're going to apply a little patch of hair here and this is dyed black elk hair so you get all the hollow hair and all the float that you need this is a size 10 hook so it takes a pretty good little patch of hair make sure that you clean your hair really really well 
and we want a pretty, pretty good patch of hair to go along with this and refine it to where you only use the longest of hairs. That's really important. Um, now what we'll do is we'll do a little more thinning to where we get all the longest of hairs here and then we'll drop it in the stacker, give it a little tap. Okay, so now we have the hair and one clue I would give you about doing any kind of wings, whether it's for your stimulators or whatever it is that you're tying, if you take a patch of hair just like this, if you take it back in the shank where my thumb and forefinger is and you pinch it really hard, that will splay the end of the hair to where you can actually lay that on there perfectly. I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to pinch it really hard and splay the hair and bring the hair back over the top here and I'm going to lay it right down over the little crystal flash and it's important that the crystal flash stays with inside the hair. That's really important because we want the glitter to come from the inside rather than the outside. And that looks like a pretty good measurement right there. So you do not have a lot of room to secure this. So you want to make sure that your spins here are really, really nice and tight. Now, here's where things get a little bit complicated on this particular tie. We have the hair that we have applied as a wing, but now we're going to convert the portion of the stem of the hair and we're going to convert that now into legs and there's a certain way that you do that. If you slip your scissors in like this and pull the hairs out in this direction, then what you do is you take a hold of the inside hair and you want a pretty good patch of this because this is all going to help in the flow to this bug. I'm going to lock that against the vise. I'm going to come across and I'm going to grab another pinch of hair from the other side, just like this. Notice how I'm pulling this now. I'm pulling it to train the legs to stay forward. And now I'm going to come forward and grab the hair. I'm going to come around to the front and make sure at this point that you clear those antennas out of there. Lay your scissors flat on top of this, the antennas and give a nice secure little snip right there. Now what we have to do is secure those legs in perfectly. Now the nature of, um, of a squala, he's a funny guy when it comes to color. When you look at the underside of the bug, he's really, really dark, almost black, but he has this intermixing of kind of, a, kind of a, uh, an olive color up inside the bug. So the way that we imitate that is, is we take a small piece of dub, short piece of dub, black. And then we take a piece of dub and blend it together. And the blend is an olive, a light olive. And what we're doing here is we're taking the light olive in a very, very thin little patch and we lay it over the top of the black dubbing, just like this in a layer, just exactly like this. We give it a nice little stretch out just like this. So they kind of blend together. Now, I'm going to come back into the thread. I'm going to spin this and I'm going to slide it right up into place. Now, as I spin this, you'll see as I begin to wrap it, you'll see that there's part of it that's kind of light olive and then there's part of it that's really black. I'm going to get a hold of the wing here and I'm going to throw it forward. I'm going to build it up nice and fat behind those legs. Just take the legs, pinch on the inside first like this, and then push everything back off the eye, just about like this. Accumulate everything into a kind of a little pile back there, and then spin in front of the legs at this point in time. At this point in time, we have now secured the legs and folded those back. I'm going to raise up the antenna, shoot the thread through just like this, and then I'm going to slip about three nice tight half hitches right in underneath the bug. What I'm going to do now is, is I'm going to show you the bug done and I'm going to rotate the vise now toward you so you can see all of the angles on this bug. So here we go. We're going to rotate now and as I move it forward, you can begin to see that look on the back of the bug and you start to see that beautiful silhouette from about that angle right there. You can see both of the antennas split wide 
and down around the egg bag, you can see the back and you can see the legs. You can start, kind of start to get an idea about how really beautiful the silhouette of this bug really is. In fact, when that squallow's on the water, he floats exactly the way this bug floats in nature. So he's a perfect combination. I'm going to roll it forward a little bit further here so you can see this angle. And then as I rotate up in this direction, you can begin to see the underside of the bug in this angle right there. And you begin to see that beautiful, beautiful striation on the inside of the body. And the underside with the thread wrap, you've got that beautiful olive that is uh, inherent to that bug. So. <clears throat> This tie is probably as close to a squala in the real world. Um, one thing about it though, our tires complain a lot about this bug because it's a tough bug to tie and it's a tough bug to make perfect. Uh, but you know, our fishermen absolutely love it. Any place that you've got a squala hatch, this is a pattern that you should be tying or buying because it is a game changer in that early part of the season on that squala hatch. This is what we call a slow stone. From about the end of October through to the end of February, we fish dry flies all winter long during that segment. And it's really interesting that we, in all that time that we fish, about the biggest bug that you fish during that four-month window is a size 20. So you kind of get accustomed to 6X tapered leaders and 6X tippets and really, really small bugs. In a lot of the Northwest, about the 1st of March through to about the middle of April, there is kind of a change of season that happens. And all of those small bugs that you fished for that four-month window of winter all of a sudden the first gigantic bug of spring appears and he's called a squala. And he is what I would refer to as the change of season, going from small bugs and working your way into big bugs. And I can't even tell you how awesome it is to be able to splat a size 10 2X long hook down over the top of a big old brown trout. Squall fishing is a whole lot of fun and it's the first big bug that you get an opportunity to fish. We're on the Owyhee River. It's the fifth day of March. And we think that there might be the leading edge of a squala hatch coming off. So the fly you see in front of you that's going to move here, um, the fly you see in front of you is a squala pattern. Way lay, belly down, a perfect representation for slow, slow water. There he was right there. Big old son of a gun. Didn't take long, did it, Jeffrey? There he is, right there. Oh, jeez! There he is! <laughs> Did you get that? Did you get that, Sammy? Did you get that, Sammy? Boy, that was a beautiful take, wasn't it? You know what's funny about that is I have been casting up in there, I just didn't have the right angle to get it right on.
Oh, jeez, did you see that? Did you see that? You didn't see his head come up? You gotta be kidding. This is a giant fish, Jeffrey. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> At Dry Fly Innovations, we are first and foremost fly tires. There are no experiences on the river that we ever have without our first experience being in the fly tying room. So we understand you tires out there. And because we do, we have developed a library. All of the flies that we sell in our catalog, we have taken the, the largest patterns or groups of patterns and we have tied those for you on DVD. And we have an extensive library that you can go in and purchase a DVD specifically and that DVD will teach you exactly how it is that we tie that particular pattern. So now we've shown you a perspective with the big video camera. Now what we'd like to do is put you in on a different angle. We'll use the chest cam here and we'll put you right down the bore of the rod and we'll give you a look at what fishing looks like through a chest cam and looking at it from a totally different angle.
We're going to show you a little piece of footage on a real close-up of a fish actually coming to the hook and for all apparent purposes it's looking as though the fish eats the bug. Now we'll show it to you in real time and then we're going to come back and revisit in slow motion and we'll show you just exactly what the fish actually does. Now you see the fish has come to the hook. The fish has even opened his mouth and it looks as though he's eaten the hook. Basically what that fish has done is, is he's opened his mouth, he has put his mouth completely around the hook, but at the last second he smelled a rat in the operation and he never closed his mouth on the hook. He turned away from the hook. Jeffrey set the hook in the fish but there was nothing to set the hook in because the fish never shut his mouth on the hook. That is a classic false take and it goes to show you that a fish can re refuse your hook even when the hook is inside its mouth. Hello, I'm Mike with Cutthroat Leader Company based out of Boise, Idaho. We're here on the Owyhee today to explain a little bit about our furled leaders. Um, furled leaders have been around for a, a couple hundred years. They previously used to make them out of horse hair, believe it or not. Um, we make our leaders out of uni thread, which is basically a polyester thread, fly tying thread that most of you are probably familiar with. It's a knotless taper. This is our dry fly leader we have in our, my hand right now, 76 inches long. We tell most people to tie on four feet minimum of tippet. There's many people across the country right now that have gotten 12 months plus out of one liter of ours. You just basically change tippet. Uh, hatch changes, you can throw 4x. If you change this to smaller flies, you can change your tippet out to 7x and deliver really tiny flies delicately. Um, the main benefit behind furled leaders is the fact that they transfer every bit of energy from your cast. So with a tapered leader, we all been there stretching it and straightening it out and trying to get rid of the coils. Um, if there's any coils left in a tapered leader, that robs your cast of memory. And the fact that furled leaders have no memory, every bit of energy travels through the leader, through to the tippet, and ultimately to your fly. So therefore your presentation is pretty much enhanced. Um, if you're a dry fly guy at all, furled leaders are definitely the way to go. So as mentioned, furled leaders have no memory. Therefore, when you open ours out of the package, it basically falls out of your hands. You can see there's no memory to it whatsoever. Nothing that's gonna 
rob your cast of the energy that's transferred from your rod. Now, this is a standard tapered leader from one of the major manufacturers. Um, we've all been here trying to open a tapered leader and you spend three to seven bucks on it and you hope that you can get it you know undone without tying a knot in, in it right from the get-go so once we get this leader undone okay now these coils I'm not sure if you can see them but we're familiar with what they are have to be stretched and straightened and many a times you know you're hoping to catch that first fish to actually straighten out the leader entirely um, with furled leaders you don't that's a non-issue you basically open the leader tie on your tippet and um, and you're ready to go and there's no none of that memory none of that coiled mess that lands on top of the water and um, making your casting more difficult so forth and so on so once you have the furled leader out of the package basically if it's a dry fly leader you're going to want to apply any type of a paste floatant um, this is a product that we carry. It's basically made by Loon Outdoors, another Boise, Idaho company. It's a paste type floatant. You could use um, muslin, gink, a quell. Any of them work, but the paste tends to work a lot better because it attaches itself to the ribs and the fibers of the leader itself. Um, you open the container, basically put on, I tell people about the amount of a pea, a small amount of floating on your finger. And if you run it down the length of a dry leader prior to a day of fishing, the leader will basically float all day long. Unless you have a 20 to 30 fish day, you might have to reapply from the fish, you know, pulling the leader underwater and going against vegetation. And um, that's basically it. This leader that I have in my hand is ends in a small tippet ring. I'm not sure if you can see it there. We sell probably 80% of our leaders come with a tippet ring. We also offer a loop on the end um, that you attach your tippet to. But with the ring, you basically tie just the same clench knot that you would tie your fly on with. So if your knot can hold the fly to the tippet, it's going to hold the tippet to this ring. Um, and it's as easy as that. So Cutthroat Leaders basically started out three years ago. And the prime leader that the company began with was our dry fly leader. Since then, we have added many different leaders to our list of products that we offer. Uh, we offer a high-vis nymph leader, which basically takes the place of a strike indicator. Um, bright orange portion of that leader floats, and you use that as a strike indicator. And it can suspend about a size 12 to a 14 bead head. We offer dry fly indicator leaders, which have the end tip of that leader is a high-vis section. And a lot of time when you're fishing small micro flies, you know, size 20s to 24s, it just makes tracking your fly that much easier. Um, we also create and build Tenkara leaders for Tenkara style fishing, spay leaders for two-handed rods, and um, lots of steelhead and salmon leaders that we ship all over the world. All these products are handmade in Boise, Idaho. Um, so it's all American made product, and we take very much pride in the product that we make. And um, we have pretty, mood, pretty good customer relations, and that's something that we're really proud of, the fact that our customer base keeps coming back to us. So um, retention rate is extremely high. So thank you for your time and we'll see you in the water. To finish up our program today, I'd like to introduce you to a music video called Hooked. It's one of 10 songs on an album that we created called Songs of the Dry Fly.
Hey, I just want to thank the audience out there for viewing Dry Fly Adventures, and I want to welcome you back next month when we go chase a fish on a caddis.